Imagine opening your email to find years of history deleted. Only a single email remains. A ransomware request for $2 million. You think to yourself, how could this happen to me? You see, there's two types of companies. Those that have been hacked and those that will be hacked. The weight of responsibility comes crashing down on you. It's the sort of responsibility you feel when your family is craving a delicious pizza. You finally open the box only to find the most cringeworthy topping that you mistakenly ordered. Join Pineapple on Pizza podcast as John and George, along with guest executives, discuss the most common and craziest cybersecurity risks followed by actionable tips and strategies that can be implemented to protect your cyber risk pie. Pineapple on Pizza is hosted by Omnistruck. Welcome to another episode of Pineapple on Pizza. Today's hosts are John and George, and we're happy to have our great guest here. He's an avid outdoorsman, an avid outdoorsman who loves to hunt and fish. He works on he's working on buying his third motorcycle after his Harley and his Ninja. He has a weakness for Diet Coke, and he's the president and CEO of the American Southwest Credit Union. Welcome to Jay Williamson. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. <laughs> and it's great to have you. Yeah. So we're going to we're going to jump right in here. So if cyber risk was a pizza and the frameworks were a crust, what's the riskiest topping you've seen and what topping would you equate that to? I think it's the broad totality of all the risk out there. When you look at having ransomware, stuffing credentials, unpatched systems, social engineering, phishing attacks, uh, it's such a broad topic and there's so many out there that I'd equate it to a supreme pizza. I mean, who's putting onions and green peppers or pineapple on a pizza? Just bull. <laughs> It kind of goes along with anything else, right? I mean, I've seen I've seen like avocado and uh, artichokes, and yeah, there's certain things that maybe just shouldn't be there, but that's okay. <laughs> so, in in regards to your role as president and CEO, uh, you know, uh, there, you know, what what keeps you up at night? What problems do you see in the industry? I think a lot of it is the, the cybersecurity side of it, um, because that's not necessarily my strength and where I come from. And I think that's the, what I'll find in a lot of businesses that I deal with and a lot of other CEOs. That's not our strength. We really know what we do on a day-to-day -day basis and we're experts. But I also know that what I don't know can take me down. And it's the cybersecurity side of it keeps me up at night because that's the one thing I can't control. I know all the other risks. I know how to avert them, uh, to, to compensate for them. But I really have to trust in people around me for the so for the cybersecurity side of it, because it's the one area of my organization and my business that I'm not an expert in. I think a lot of people would find that same same thing. Uh, you know, the technology can get very deep and 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 broad at the same time. Uh, and the, anybody that has looked at the industry, you know, trying to understand it. I mean, security and then uh, cyber risk and everything else. It 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 gets pretty deep down in there. So. I definitely can understand that being a, a hole. I think it's I think it's a hole for a lot of our a lot of the customers that we see and, and or a lot of the, the businesses that we that we've been in. As far as you know, as far as your business, I mean, being being in credit unions and, and banking around like you have, I mean, you, you've got a lot of regulatory requirements. I mean, how, how do you how are you? What are your biggest challenges when you're dealing with those regulatory requirements? We do have a lot of them, and, and the ones that are most in the news today, of course, everybody's familiar with the bank failures that are going on, and I get that that those questions a lot, especially when it relates to what's the difference between a credit union and a bank? Why did they fail? Why am I different? And, and it, we're really apples and oranges from the credit union side and what the what those banks that particularly failed are, um, and that comes to the risk deference side of it. They're, they weren't managing their assets and their liabilities to their balance sheet. And I think that is, it doesn't matter what businesses you're in, you have to understand what where your risks are uh, and match up, especially your cash flow with what your balance sheet looks like. So I, we've spent a lot of time in that. Um, the last nine months, my, my board and myself have spent an extraordinary amount of time talking about what our balance sheet looks like, what our liquidity looks like, and how we're going to manage to those. 
Uh, for instance, we have done everything on our investment side very short. We don't do that. We don't look at our investments as a way to make money. We look at it as a way to manage our liquidity so that we're always safe and sound. We don't have almost all of our um, portfolio in our liability section there is three years and less. And Silicon Valley Bank had 30 years and more. And there's a huge difference between one, two, and three years and 30 years. So they just didn't have the liquidity when they needed it. And we're, we're not that way. Almost all of ours are set so that we know when exactly when our cash flow is going to come in and how it's going to come in so that we don't take on that risk. Uh, we take enough risk on our loan portfolio. That's where almost all banks have typically failed is having too much risk in their loan portfolio. So we don't. We know that's where our, the majority of our risk is. So we try to make sure that we don't have risk in our liability and our uh, investment side of it. So that's just a short five seconds of why we're different. Yeah. So I mean, what, and it sounds and one of the things that we do is we talk about risk transference. Uh, and and when we talk about that, what we're talking about is we we talk about it from a cybersecurity standpoint. But in, in your case, it sounds like it's much more from a from a liquidity standpoint that is more important. Uh, and, and that's why some of the banks are failing. And, and so there are regulatory requirements, though, that, that have liquidity events, right? And, and, and a certain yes. uh, that are required. And, and, and that, I believe that's why the banks were shut down. Is that correct? That's exactly right. And that's what I was trying to get to is those banks didn't manage that liquidity risk the way they should. And there are set rules out there. For the credit union side, it's called our NEV, our net economic value. What is the value of our organization in any given moment? A lot of what comes into play is what you've heard in the news uh, is the unrealized losses in those investment portfolios. Every credit, every bank, every credit union out there has some amount if, if they've done any investing at all. But the, what the regulators look at is how well you're managing in that and how short that risk is um, and how well you've managed it. And th that's the big regulation right now. And that's why they did get shut down is they didn't manage that well at all. Well, Jay, I mean, definitely based on based on your background, you, you, you've definitely managed that very well. I mean, you, you worked for a few banks, looks like a couple acquisitions in, in your past there. So you're, you're, you're pretty much an expert at doing those things. Uh, what, what would you what would you call the secret of your success in that? Is it, is it just being a little bit more conservative? Is it being you know, is it, is it transferring that risk? Is it uh, what, what, what makes you that successful? I think a lot of it is that my philosophy is different than a lot of other philosophies. I feel like that what I do uh, in my organization plays a huge role in our members' lives. We're here to, for the, the financial success of our members and our communities. So I'm, there's nothing that I'm going to do to risk that position and opportunity to make a dollar. I mean, a lot of banks are driven by bottom line. We're going to maximize the, all of our earnings. They have shareholders and call reports every quarter of how much money they can make. So they're going to take risks that I'm not going to. That's not what I'm driven. My, my mission and my goal of my organization is not to maximize income. It's to maximize opportunity for our organization, for our community, and for our people. So we don't take a lot of risks that we don't have to. We are a little bit more conservative. And, I, and I'll say what a lot of those big banks did that you see fail is they forgot about blocking and tackling. We do the right things for the right reasons every day. And that's, we want to do the small things. My father always told me uh, that if you take care of your pennies, your dollars will take care of yourself, of themselves. And that doesn't, it's not just financial advice. It's pretty much in business and every aspect of your life. If you'll manage the small things, the big things will usually take care of themselves. And that's really my philosophy on running an organization and why we've had success. We've just done the little things well day in and day out. Well, one thing that, uh, I think that any CEO knows that uh, that making sure that there are measurable objectives and goals uh, is critical to success, and so that that, that attributes attributed to the the small things. And uh, there's also a visionary component as well on where are we going and why are we going in that direction. Um, and uh, with all these, what are now um, just a a flood of laws that are coming down for doing what essentially is banking online and doing business um, uh, that deal with the rights and the privacy of individuals rather than concerning so much about really whether or not you get hacked. I think lawmakers think, think that everyone is probably going to get hacked at some point, no matter what you invest in. 
And so did you do your homework and are you managing that risk properly is what a lot of these, what they call omnibus privacy laws talk about. Um, in your situation, you know, what do you think the right thing is to do now that we have six states that now have these laws? And so if you have somebody that's part of your bank and they move to that state and you still have their data, you know, what does that mean for the bank, right? So, and this is a discussion I've had with many credit unions over the years, uh, and I get uh, uh, maybe the same answer quite often, which is, well, what applies to us is what we'll consider, right? Um, and, uh, and so that becomes what essentially is another risk to add to the pile. So, so in your experience, you know, what has either your, been your, um, your biggest concern when it comes to all these kind of regulations that are related to doing business online, is anything stood out for you that kind of caught your ear like, oh, I, I better make sure I'm on top of that? I don't know whether this is really true or whether it's just what I hear, but there's so many people that talk about and get so upset. Of, oh, all these regulations are changing uh, and they want to fight and argue or whatever. That's never been my approach. It, if that's the regulations and that what's and that's what we have to do, that's just what we're going to do. I don't give it an, a second thought. Here's our problem. Here, let me find a solution and we'll get it in place. A lot of the things that you're talking about, we don't do on the in-house. We don't have that human capacity to do it. Um, I try to make sure I go back to the blocking and tackling. I make sure I have the absolute best people that I can to take care of our day-to-day -day things the things that are going to impact most of our members on a day-to-day -day basis. And then we really do rely on a lot of outside sources uh, and try to bring in the best experts that we can outside. So that they, because they are focused on those things, they are the expert more than what I'm going to be in, in, be able to employ in-house. So I really try to make sure that our membership and our organization has the best of both worlds. And we do that by, finding places where we can outsource and bring in the best talent and not worry necessarily about it being ours. But that is a risk because there's so much there that once again, that's something I can't control. That's I can control so much, but I can't control that part of it. And it keeps me up at night, but I, I just don't know that there's a better solution. Yeah. Get helpers is the common answer um, in, in many businesses, not just in banking, but any anywhere where there's, you know, complex regulatory issues. So yeah, banking finance, uh, are the two biggest that uh, uh, like in healthcare, it was HIPAA for a number of years. So health portability and or with electronic medical record issues, right? I think you're on the right track. You know, reach out to the helpers and uh, you'd be surprised what you can learn from uh, from the experts that you know deal with this every day, especially in legal, because there's just so many um, attorneys out there, but not many that focus on what essentially is the tech. Right, the cybersecurity and the tech. So, um, but uh, you know, generally speaking, that's where, when it comes to regulations and laws, that's the first place that most organizations tend to turn is outside helpers. So, yeah, we have to. There are partners. We're we're not going to be successful if we don't have some great partners out there. And and we're very lucky. We have here in Sierra Vista, we have one of the campuses of University of Arizona, and it happens to be their cybersecurity because of where we're located. We also have Fort Huachuca just outside of our city limits, which is very much a high-tech industry and national security. So we have a lot of experts right here locally that most people don't have. So I actually think we have one of the best cybersecurity programs out there just because we have some of those people local and access to them on a daily basis. You know, when I think about our, our primary question, right, if it were, if cyber risk was a pizza or if risk in general was a pizza, um, it almost kind of feels like the regulations are, are a lot of the time, hey, we're going to come in and we want you to turn your pizza into calzone. We don't want anybody to be able to see inside of what you're doing. Right? Yes. <laughs> so that came to me when you said the whole pizza. And I was like, yes. And what what regulations are asking people to do is it's not a pizza anymore. It's a calzone. Close it up. Block it off. You know, and, uh, you know, so. Um, you know, perhaps I've answered my own question on if cyber risk were a pizza, would I turn it into a calzone? I, you know, I hadn't thought of that, but I think you're exactly right. That's exactly what our our regulators don't want us to take any risk at all. I mean, they want it locked down to the point where we would never be able to do business. Yeah, uh, if yeah. we really did everything they wanted, we wouldn't be in business anymore. Yeah, true, true. And the I don't know about you, but anytime we go to a pizza place, very few people order calzones. And so, I love those as a kid. I haven't had one in years, but they were yeah. one of my favorites. 
<laughs> maybe that will change with the regulations. Everyone will be eating calzones instead of pizzas. And then, oh, what are we going to do about our podcast, John? <laughs> uh, I guess we'll have to go to like empanadas then, George. I mean, you know, where I mean, <laughs> since Jay and I are so close to the border here, I mean, empanadas would be the next the next best thing. <laughs> <laughs> So, Jay, uh, what what excites you about the future? I mean, is there, you know, I mean, obviously these banks and everything else are are having their issues and, and regulators are coming in and, they're, they're, you know, we, we, we seem to go around about this every so often with, with the banking industry. But but there's got to be something that excites you about what's what's happening and, and what, what, what you see about the future, you know, both from a cyber standpoint and, and just from a banking standpoint. I think from a banking standpoint and any business standpoint, I, I'm excited about opportunity. I knew whenever COVID came along that there were going to be organizations that failed and there were going to be organizations that thrived. And it was just about finding that opportunity. And I can tell you that the organization that I was with at that point in time, we found a niche that we could fill and we grew like crazy and did some of the best we'd ever done. And whenever I came here, we looked and that was the first thing I did when I got here. Are we maximizing our opportunities? And we found places to do that. And I think what you're seeing, the consolidation in the industry and all the bank failures, people being concerned for the first time about some of their money and some issues. We are in a very good position to, to help those. Just today, we launched uh, a new product where we can insure any member or business up to $250 million with guaranteed coverage insurance instead of the $250,000. Uh, so we've really gone out of our way to make sure that we're giving the best products and services and I know that we put ourselves at the forefront to be successful for a very long time. We look, ex- we're a hundred percent different than the banks that failed. And I think right now that's our be- biggest selling point is that we offer things that those huge banks that are supposed to be great and unfailable, they can't offer and they can't do that we can. And that, that excites me because I know that we're on the right track and that we're always going to be able to take care of our members and our communities. I- that's amazing. I, I, you know, I, I think we might have to have a little chat about that after the after the podcast here. Oh, I'd be look. happy to do that. This this is what I love to do. Uh, our our mission and goal is to help our members on their financial journey and give them the best possible financial life that they can have, so that our communities can be successful. Well, thanks for sharing, Jay. I know that uh, I think everyone is worried. Every every individual is is worried to some degree about their banking situation if their money is protected. Um, uh, and and how they, uh, especially those that have more than what was the traditional FDIC coverage, um, and uh, you know because that's their retirement, right? And there's a lot of people that are like that, you know, where they keep that money in banks. So, uh, so I can I can understand you know their fear. Sure. Uh, so it sounds like you that your team has a, a lot of those worries addressed. Uh, and that's fantastic to hear that you've got you know, you're focusing on what essentially is those details. So thank you for d- doing what you do. We appreciate it. You bet. It's it's our pleasure. It's it's my life's passion. Fantastic. And you've been successful at it, which is wonderful. That, that I mean, we like seeing that too. <laughs> well, I hope so. Anyway, uh, the success we have is is really due to my team. I'm lucky to have one of the best teams that I've ever worked with, and they've driven our success as well as our members and our just our community accepting us as for who we are. All right. So I got to ask this question because I, I noticed that you moved from bank to bank here and, you know, after each successful exit. So this isn't a normal question, but I mean, are you taking the same team with you so that you know that you've got the good team or are you building more team members as you go along? No, I've never taken a team member from place to place. That's one of the things that I have always wanted to strive in is to be able to get along and work with anybody. Uh, yeah. And and there's, there's truly a, a both two sides of that coin. I understand why a lot of CEOs bring along other people because you do have that immediate bond. Everybody's on the same page, pulling the same direction. You know who has what strengths and has what weaknesses. But I think there's, I've seen a lot of, com- how do I want to say it? Way too many people don't ever want to get out of their comfort zones and that there's just an internal strife. I want to be the guy that is known for being able to work with anybody and everybody. To have that personality that just says, hey, no matter what team I'm on, I can help them be successful. So I've always taken that. And I think there's whenever you walk into a new organization, there's always that what's this person going to be like? And and I want to build those relationships and build those bonds and be able to work with anybody that's there so that they 
feel like what they put their life into. I mean, I've got a lot of people here that have been here 20, 25 years. If I walked in and brought my team, what does that mean for the, the, the lifetime that they've invested in their organization? I'm not going to take that away from anybody. That's the last thing I want to do. So I've never taken anybody, not that I, there might be a time that I wouldn't or bring somebody on, but my goal is to work with the people that have built the organization. I'm just one piece of it. Yeah, I, yeah. I'm not even the big piece of it. I, I'm the small piece. I think a lot of CEOs are, that, you know, do bring team members with them. Right? Um, sometimes that creates culture shock right, within the footprint of the organization. So you come in with a vision and then in come these leaders that might be altering the culture. Um, it's in many cases, I think it's best to make sure that the, the, the culture footprint match um, that are, exists within the organization. Um, it, it's a stronger team if you can improve on that, right? So if you need to, to make the shift on the mindset of how the organization and what the goals and what you're doing in the trenches as far as footprint, that, um, you know, if, if that's your superpower, you're one of the rare ones that are that are out there in banking. Um, so that's, uh, I think it's a fantastic approach. Um, what do you think is the biggest struggle when you land uh, in a new place um, that those first 30 days that you're watching or you're learning, uh, what's the hardest thing to figure out, do you think? I guess I've been very, very blessed. Um, I, I have, The way I have approached every time that I've came into a new organization is I have went and sat down and had a conversation with every single person within the organization. I, I'll have about a list of 20 different questions so that I get to know them. I get to know what they think. The problems are, and most of the time, once you start listening, they'll tell you what your, the problems are. Um, they'll tell you what you're. They'll tell you what they're doing best, and they'll tell you where what needs to be fixed. And if you just listen to people, it makes your job. It makes my job as a leader very, very easy. They've already told me what we do really, really well, so I don't change those things. They'll tell me what they really hate and what's wrong, so I just fix what they've already said was wrong, and they wanted to fix anyway and just couldn't. So they're now. Nothing changed that they didn't want to see changed and we're doing what we've always done well and we fixed the things that were broken and that they wanted to change and just couldn't. So they're really, really excited. Uh, I mean, I, the old adage of you can lead a horse, but you can't make it drink. If you take a thirsty horse to water, you don't have to make it do anything or drink on its own. Lead people where they want to go uh, and don't change the things that are, don't fix the problems that are not problems. Just fix the things that everybody already recognizes uh, and maybe the unspoken rule or the worst kept secret, just fix that and you'll, you'll do very, very well. Uh, that's been my approach and how I've done it. It hasn't, it's, and so it's been fairly easy because I just listened to what they already told me. So, so Jay, I mean, how did you, how did you get all this experience? I mean, were you, did you read books? Did you go to events? What, you know, I mean, how, 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 how'd you be, how'd you become so successful at this? Uh, all of the above. So I always knew I wanted to be a CEO from a very young age. My dad was a, a serial entrepreneur uh, and he gave me a lot of experience. He basically turned the family farm over to me when I was 16 and I screwed that up every which way but possible. <laughs> I, I mean, I should have been fired from our family business 10 or 15 times, but I remember all the things that he told me. Um, for instance, uh, there was one time that he told me to go get all the 600 pound calves and ship them off to market. I was there by myself doing all of it it was hot. I let one 315, 315 pound calf get in the trailer. And it just wasn't, I didn't think it was worth my time to unload all that trailer to get the calf back out. I just left it in there, got the rest of the steers and took it off. Picked up the sales sheet and, and dad's calves had brought 85 cents a pound. Mine brought a buck 15. And I came, went walking into his office so proud of myself for getting a dollar 15 cent a pound when he got 85. And then he pulled out the calculator and multiplied 600 times 85. And a dollar fifteen times three thirty-five, and he said, "Who got more for their calf and how their calves? Who made more money? And how much? What were we going to have to put inputs to that calf for the rest of that summer? Zero. So you just lost two hundred fifteen dollars. It was worth unloading the trailer. I pay you four bucks an hour. I mean, I remember lots and lots of time, mistakes that I made like that of taking care of the details, but him giving me that opportunity at sixteen and letting me screw up royally." has really helped. And, and along the process, I knew I wasn't ever going to have the CEO experience until you have the CEO experience. 
So I've done everything I can to learn about leadership. I go to a global leadership summit. I'm their biggest proponent and I don't get a thing for that, but it's by far the best leadership education you can get for 200 bucks. And I take mine and my whole team every year because it's so much value. Um, Craig Rochelle says, when leaders get better, everybody gets better. And that's the most true statement I've ever heard. If your leadership can grow and you can grow as a leader, your, your organization has unlimited potential. And I believe that with all the bottom of my heart. Great. Are, are there any books that you would recommend for, for our listeners? Uh, you know, one of my favorite ones is not really not even about leadership. It's called Never Split the Difference by Craig Boss. Um, if you haven't read that, he was an FBI negotiator. And I use his negotiating skills all the time that he taught in that book. That's um, just almost on a daily basis. We, we, I, I think both George and I have read that one as well already, but it, it, definitely a good reminder. So moving more to you personally. So where did, so you talk about living on the farm, where'd you get your education? How did, you know, how did, how does somebody become Jay? I mean, you obviously reading the books, you know, going to these events and, and growing, but you know, what, tell, tell us a little bit about your history. Uh, I, I did grow up on a farm. I grew up a rodeo cowboy. Um, I, I literally started rodeo and when I was six years old, did it through high school, college, professionally. Uh, please don't grow up. In the, we don't need any other J's out in this world. One is too many. Uh, so, uh, But I'd say just do whatever is authentic to you. I, I'm the same person day in and day out. At least I try to be. I, I'm not. I don't pre- pretend to be anything special. All I can pretend to be is somebody that cares about community, cares about people, and is willing to learn on a daily basis. So wh- where did you go to school and when, what did you study? Uh, I went to school. I went to several kind of moved colleges about like I've moved jobs, but I graduated from Southeastern Oklahoma State University in Duran, Oklahoma. I got my master's degree from Western Governors University online. Um, Then I've also graduated from SMU, the the Southwestern Graduate School of Banking. uh, Education is very, very important to me. It is to my, has been to my family. So every chance I get to further education, it's brought a lot of value because especially even now, I mean, I just finished my master's degree last year after almost 30 years in business. And I see a lot of the education that I got and how they matched up. And it really, I didn't think I needed it at that point in time, but it truly took my career to another level, I would say. Hey, I understand you have one granddaughter and, and I'm, I'm assuming you've got, you know, some, some kids along the way there and then had a family. So you, you know, yeah. tell, us, tell us a little bit about that. I have two wonderful kids. I have a 32 year old daughter and a two-year-old granddaughter, and I have a 16-year-old son. Both of my kids are adopted. Uh, We adopted my son. My daughter adopted us, and I came to live with both of us together about the exact same time, but I couldn't be more proud of either one of them, especially my daughter. She's my hero. Uh, She was literally on the streets when she came to us, and now she's a mom and a successful businesswoman. Uh, She's my hero. I mean, she could have been any of those statistics that you see on a daily basis of kids gone wrong, and she just never allowed that to happen to herself. she is my hero, one of them for sure. I can definitely understand that. I, I have a, a nephew that uh, became kind of a more like a son to me, and uh, now he's an electrical engineer and you know working, you know, making got a good job and everything else. But it definitely could have gone the other way. So, I, I, based on his history, so I'm, I'm I'm glad to hear it. I'm glad I love hearing those success stories of family and 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 how things you know how, how one person can actually change or you know a, a family unit can change somebody's life and turn it to the right way. So that's great. Now she was supposed to live with us for two months. And I told her the day she came in that I have no idea how to raise a teenager other than to treat you like you're my daughter. And she decided we were mom and dad. And it's been that way for 15 years now. So she definitely a, couldn't be any more my daughter than if I'd raised her in her, her entire life. So, so what, what else drives you? What's, what, what are your passions? What do you like to do outside of work? I love to hunt and fish. I love to do anything outside. And I say hunt and fish. I, I used to, my dad used to say I was a professional hunter and only worked part time just to get by. But now I really I love what I do. I mean, people talk about work life balance. My work. I love to work. I mean, this, this is what I do. This is my passion because I feel like this. I'm not going to cure cancer. I'm not going to do anything like that. But if I can change 75 lives, I'm, I'm a CEO because I can change 75 lives the people that count on me to make the right decisions on a daily basis. And I can put them in a position to succeed and and have the best work-life balance that they can have. And they can be successful. If they're successful at work, 
they're successful at home, they're successful at home, they're successful at work, they're better moms, better dads, better husbands, better wives. That's how, and, and if you can change that part of the community, then you can change an entire community and that's how we can change the country. It's just by doing our parts right. So I'm very passionate about what I do, but it's not necessarily the banking side or anything else. It's putting people in a, in a position to succeed and have their best life. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. So true, and it takes a village, you know, of uh, to to do what you need to do, right? and whether it's uh, the village of your entity or your community. Um, as my, my one of my grandfathers used to say, "Let's go pick up a shovel. Let's go Let's pick up the shovel, right? Get it done. You know, you you, you we're all good workers. We're all hard workers. So, uh, and you just don't forget things like that." Now, that was in Spanish when he said it to me. I want to make, make, make a special note of that. So it didn't quite sound like that. Exactly. But um, I remembered it. Well, and I, I, also, I also noticed that you had quite a few awards for best places to work or best workplaces, uh, you know, on, on your on your profile. And so, uh, you know, that, that that's great to see. And we, we, we actually just got the ink, one of the ink uh, best places to work for Omnistruck. So we're, we're very similar when it comes to, to our employees and, and trying to make those changes. Uh, in, in our employees' lives as well, so we we appreciate that. That that's one of, probably one of my most proud awards is because that's as you know that's given out really by the employees the the survey right. measures their engagement and how much they enjoy coming to work and I'm very proud of that side of it because I know that we're putting people on a chance to succeed and I, like I said I really do think that's how we're going to change communities and change the world is by doing that. I mean I had one of my employees the other yesterday go out to a, one of our members' home because she couldn't figure out how to get signed on online. So she went to her house to do that. Now, we don't do that all the time, but I mean, I didn't ask my employee to do that. She took it upon herself because she wanted our member to have the best experience possible. Uh, thrills me when I, I hear stories like that. Well, we have a, a self-funded program called Random Act of Kindness. People have donated in our organization. They just donate so that anybody within our organization that, whether they donate it or not, and do something kind. If they see somebody in need, whether that's a coat or just buy a copy for the person behind them. But I'm thrilled to be a part of an organization that does things like that and puts other people first uh, and brings light into a dark community. I, I think that's what we lack more and more all the time is people being kind. And that's what I hope our organization is known for is being kind. I'm familiar with another organization that actually gives their employees, uh, you know, like a, a one one day a month off to go volunteer or you know help help and you know help other organizations uh, with their missions to succeed. As and, and it's a paid day off, it's a, or a paid day for 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 doing that to, to again give back to the community and really try and help help that help move that forward. So we do that, and I require every one of my senior team team members to volunteer to be on a board of a, of a local charity. That's just what we're going to do is be a part. We're going to take our best people and we're going to put them in positions in the community to help the community succeed. Again, I'd love to hear that. That's uh, how can you expect people to own the jobs? The job owns them if you're not taking care of them first. So, yeah, that's, uh, that's definitely uh, a, a, that's a group consideration as well as an individual pursuit. Um, so it's, uh, it's nice to hear like-minded, uh, ideas. So, uh, because I can tell you for certain, um, we're seeing less and less of those kinds of CEOs and organizations that, you know, if you focus on you know, what you can do for the people that work for you, how to make them better because the company just gets better. Right. So if you take care of those folks that are working for you and help them grow and, and help them learn, um, there is, uh, Bound to be a positive outcome, right? So, yeah, we're a community financial organization. We know, I know, if our community succeeds, we'll succeed. Uh, I put everything I do into making sure that our community succeed because I know the end result is that we'll follow as well. So, speaking of community, what do you consider your footprint? You know, how far north are you? You'll get into Tucson. Do you go beyond that? Are you where, where are you in terms of your footprint of? Uh, 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 we want to call it your 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 baseline of, of locations and who you serve. So we have a field of membership. Uh, that's one thing different about credit, credit unions in general. We have a very defined um, area or field of membership. 
Ours is the five Southeast counties in Arizona. But okay. we are lucky that we have a little clause that we can sponsor in. Any member can sponsor in a new member. So technically we can go anywhere that we want to go as long as there's at least one degree of connection there. But five, the five Southeastern counties, which does include Tucson, is our main footprint. But we're really trying to serve rural Arizona, the places that the bigger banks have left and don't care about anymore and are just draining funds out of. We're going in there and supporting and giving back to those communities and trying to be trying to be the biggest fish in smaller ponds because we know that we can make the biggest impact in those areas and take care of more people that have been neglected and I'm not going to say abused, but have not been given all the opportunities that they can because they're not in a large area. We'll take care of them and we'll do it because that's our passion. We want to see smaller towns succeed. We want to see individuals succeed. We want to see rural Arizona succeed. Yeah, yeah, um, I, I can I can understand that I, some of the some of the work that I've done in the past is rural broadband, being able to bring internet you know high speed internet connections in rural parts of uh, um, uh, of every state in the nation, and so we do a lot of it. Believe it or not, you know, northeastern California is very rural, so as you start start to get up you know into the you know Idaho border and Oregon borders. And they still only had DSL for a long period of time. And uh, through national initiatives, you know, uh, you need to get these people connected. Right? So how are they going to do their online banking? You know, if they can't even get a dial-up connection, right? So, and that was kind of the challenge. I've been lobbying to many congressmen for the exact same thing. We have to have that connection is so vital, especially in this day and age. So, thank you for doing that because it really is. It's huge. And, but it's also so much fun. It's so rewarding when you can take something to somebody that they haven't had before and that it really changes their lives. So uh, the, whether it's broadband or financial services, I'm glad to hear that because that's how we make a difference in the world. But you're still having that issue? It's getting better all the time. But yes, though, there are still pockets that don't have as high a speed of connection as they need and or reliable. We're moving into a market right now that there is only one provider and that provider is not the world's greatest by any stretch of the imagination. Mm -hmm. uh, we had another very rural market and that just now got Cox Internet. We were What we had was almost as bad as dial-up until just a couple months ago. Mm -hmm. So yes, it's, it is still very much an issue today. Oh, well, how about I give you a follow-up on that? That'd be uh, great. Is, uh, I, I, I know some people that might be able to help there in, in, in unimaginable ways. So I'll, I'll see what I can do. Um, do it, Sean, I'm sorry. I, I, I know you probably had another question to ask because since you know what the new. So, Jay, here, here's, you know, we're, we're, we're coming to the end here. But I mean, so if, if you could go back in time and give your younger self some advice, what, what would that advice be? Swing for the fences early and often. I mean, I, I knew what I wanted to do and be a long time ago. And I waited to my mid 40s thinking that I needed to have a certain pro progress and a certain path. And I realize now looking back, I was never going to be ready, but I should have done what I did in my 40s and my 30s. Uh, so what and what would I have lost if I had tried and failed? Nothing. So I, everybody out there, it, my, my advice is to do what you want to do. Swing for the fences because you've got nothing to lose and everything to gain. Excellent. And, and Jay, where can people find you? LinkedIn is probably the best place. And I, and I also don't mind. I'm happy to help anybody any way I can. I mean, that's my motto in life. So my email address is CEO servant leader at gmail.com. I'll be, I'll answer every email that I get. And, and, and what's your company website? ASCU.org. Perfect. We'll, we'll, we'll keep track of that. All right. Well, to our audience, we'd like to thank you uh, for listening. And, and if you've learned something today or laughed or uh, tell someone about this podcast and share. Uh, Jay, we absolutely appreciate you being here. It's, it's been wonderful. And, and you know, we've learned some things from you. And then it sounds like we're, you know, we're going we're gonna to have to continue the conversation here when, when not everybody's listening. But that's OK. Uh, we, we keep it short for, the, for that very reason for our, for our people. But there it is. The, this has been another great episode of Pineapple on Pizza with your hosts, John and George, and we'll see you next time. Thank you, everybody. Thank you all for joining another great episode of Pineapple on Pizza. You can find show notes, links, and resources by visiting omnistruct.com forward slash blog. 
And a huge thank you to all who are preventatively protecting organizations from cyber threats.